Hi, I'm Matt Womap, and I'm here at the happiest place on earth, Disneyland. You know, it's hard to believe that it all started more than 50 years ago. My memories actually go back long before there was a Disneyland to the various plans that, that kind of came and went before Anaheim. Uh, the first one being across the street from the studio in that little strip of land between Riverside Drive and the river, which, which we owned. And there, was, uh, there were plans for a uh, little teeny weeny Disneyland there, but Walt of course couldn't stay within that kind of a boundary. And so in his mind he built a bridge across the river for the railroad and took the railroad all the way down to through Griffith Park and back, uh, which the city actually apparently considered and, and thought might not be such a bad idea. Uh, they're gonna go clear past Travel Town and down to you know Los Feliz and, and, uh, and back. So it was a pretty good train trip. Um, didn't happen, of course. And then there was Chatsworth. And I remember going clear out to Chatsworth with my dad one time to look at a big piece of land out there uh, up against the hills in the, in the northwest uh, end of the valley. There's a big rocky outcropping not so far from where uh, Rocketdyne wound up. And uh, that was going to be a great western set, it was going to be a lot of stuff like that, uh, but it again fell through. I think uh, the traffic patterns of, of people weren't as conducive to, to good attendance. And about that time when, when they began looking around in other places was about the time that I went to Salt Lake City to work on a movie called Perry. So I kind of got out of the loop in terms of uh, hearing about it from my dad and hearing, you know, stuff around the lot. Uh, and that's when they found this property down in uh, Anaheim. So I remember very well knowing that property because I had gone to college at Pomona and Harbor Boulevard was how we got from Pomona to the beach. So we used to go right by where Disneyland wound up for years. Uh, and it really was orange groves, I promise you. Um, so th that's a kind of the, the long build-up in my mind to uh, how it started in the first place. Walt uh, Disney uh, actually incorporated what was called Wet Enterprises, Walter Elias Disney Enterprises, in December of 1952. And the whole purpose was to work with him in creating Disneyland and uh, one of my favorite stories about those early days was uh, Walt went to uh, his friend and neighbor Welton Beckett the architect who did the Century Plaza Hotel his firm and and the Los Angeles the music center in Los Angeles and uh, said um, uh, Mr. Beckett I want you to work uh, with me on, on uh, developing Disneyland and Mr. Beckett was very astute. He said to Walt, what is it? <laughs> and probably for the first time Walt had to describe what he wanted to do with Disneyland. And uh, Mr. Beckett was, uh, as I said, very astute. He said, uh, you know Walt, you're going to use architects, uh, but you're going to have to train your own people to design the park. And that's what Walt did. The idea was not making movies, <laughs> which is all we'd done up to that point. And number two, there was a little thing about money and how it was going to get paid for. And uh, I, I know my dad was very nervous about that. Um, and there's this, of course, this legendary story about uh, Walt spending a weekend with Herbie Ryman 
drawing up this grandiose plan for what Disneyland was going to look like in two days. And my dad flying off to New York to the bankers with it that, that either that night or the next morning uh, and selling it on the basis of Herbie's drawing, you know. And I think he raised $10 million or something like that towards uh, what eventually wound up being 17 in the original investment. And I think it wasn't long after that, using the same drawing, that he convinced uh, Leonard Goldenson at ABC to make a sort of a swap where they loaned us $5 million. And in return for that, Walt did this Wonderful World of Disney show, or, or the show was actually called Disneyland originally, um, on ABC, which was trying to become a network at the time, and, and I think that show probably put ABC into the big leagues. Uh, so there was 15 of the 17 pretty much raised right there. Um, still had to build it. And, and that got done in just an astonishingly short time. Uh, I came home from Salt Lake City, I guess, three or four times in the course of of the building of the park and we'd always go down there and wander around and see how it was going. And it was pretty amazing to see what, what that orange grove turned into and how short a time it happened. Opening day was very difficult because we had a plumbing strike about a month before the opening and there was a big meeting. And the decision was, and Walt was there and he made it, there was not enough time physically to get all of the restrooms done and all the drinking fountains. So Walt made a very profound statement. He said, well, he said, we got to do the restrooms. They can drink Coke and Pep Pepsi, but they can't pee in the street. <laughs> well, I was a ticket taker at the main gate. That was my first job at Disneyland. And uh, they had planned to schedule people to come to Disneyland in different time elements, different waves of people. Well, being that uh, Anaheim was a little country town and all the local people that, was in, that were invited, uh, they wanted to make sure they saw all the celebrities. So everyone kind of arrived at one time and, and uh, scheduling people in waves, I don't think really worked all that well. So our job at the main gate was uh, a real PR job to keep everybody happy and letting them in at the uh, time that was uh, given to them for their, on their invitation. So it was a, it was a busy day, and, but a fun day. I had been living in Salt Lake City and, and came home for opening day. The park was full of camera crews and, and camera cables in those days, you know, the, the snakes everywhere on the ground and covered with boards. You couldn't go into any of the lands because the camera crews were in there. And the show that, that was made an hour and a half live on the air opening day show was predicated on the idea that we they were allowing people into each of the lands one at a time and there were dancers in there and so on. She had twice as many as they expected, I think. There were something like 25 or 30,000 people there, I think, I was told. They're all jammed in the main street in, the, in the, that little confined area. There's nothing to do, there's no water fountains. I guess the lines to the toilets were beyond around the block. Um, Everybody's sweating. The, the ladies are all dressed up in corsets and high heels in those days, and the heels are sinking into the asphalt because it just got laid the night before. Um, it was disaster, you know. And even when you did get into one of the one of the lands as they opened them up, there's still camera cables draped all over the place and and uh, grips telling you to get out of the way and light showers and the whole thing. Uh, so it was not exactly your best PR day. Um, it was bound to produce bad reviews. But my wife, my five-year-old son, we were so sent into the park at one o'clock. We we knew when we got there, it was a problem. It was just lines you couldn't believe. But you know, we we got to go in. My son who had been looking forward to, you know, going to Disneyland for the first time, got on one ride, the canal boat. 
and it took an hour to get on. The boat sailed away. He didn't come back for two hours. And nobody knew, you know, where, where they were, what happened. Pretty soon a bunch of guys in the water with ropes pulled the boat back in and broke down. On the opening day, it was a wonderfully exciting time because I'd been broadcasting for years, you know. I've done openings of World's Fairs in Texas and, San, and L.A. and San Francisco. And this was a kind of a World's Fair opening, which meant confusion, uh, desperate calls for help because they couldn't find a microphone someplace where we were supposed to land, and uh, crowds that were coming in more than expected, a very, very hot day, and no rehearsal at all because we didn't know how we was going to go. I was the steerer, I was the host, and uh, I was in my element. I love these kinds of things. The unexpected, the unrehearsed, the uh, sudden opportunities that you couldn't have dreamed of, uh, and they were all there waiting to be exploited, and we did it for a couple of hours. And of course, it was all by invitation, and they were going to have 11 or 12,000 people, but 20 to 25,000 showed up over the wall, under the gate, through fake passes, friends ooshing in people that they were able to get through in a crowd. So they ran out of food, they ran out of water, they ran out of toilets. Everything was a kind of a mess, but in the midst of all that mess, was uh, Walt Disney, Ronald Reagan, Bob Cummings, and myself ready to take on all comers. So it was an exciting time. The one thing that made Walt frustrated is when he didn't have enough money to get things done. And he would let his creative people really kind of design, and then he had this great ability to, to bring them back to where we could afford to open it. And he made this statement a long, long time ago. He said, look, We've got to get the show open. We can always go back and plus it. And that's really what's happened, frankly, from the very beginning. All the shows have been gone back and have been made better. I'll tell you, when I really, uh, really realized what Disneyland was all about and the type of entertainment that, that Walt Disney was doing is that he was hosting the famous evangelist, Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And I think this was back in 1964. And I was there to make sure everything went well. And we walked down Main Street, and Billy Graham had never been there. and we. Went into Jungle Cruise because Walt loved the Jungle Cruise. And we got off and Billy Graham stops and they're standing together and I'm right there. And Billy Graham says, Walt, what a, what a fantastic world. What a marvelous world of fantasy. And Billy said, and Walt said to Billy, look around, look at all the people, all smiling, all having fun, all nationalities, all languages. Billy, this is the real world, the fantasies outside. And he gets stopped to think about it that's really true. A good song is good in any language anywhere in the world. And today, look at the Walt Disney Company and Parks and Resorts. We're truly around the world. We're bringing a lot of happiness to a lot of people. After we did our training, we walked down Main Street to our designated areas of employment, in my being Fantasyland, and that's the first time I saw Walt Disney. And Walt was standing in front of the Penny Arcade talking to our directors and contractors, uh, etc. This was the first time I had ever seen a movie star. Now, Walt was well known, but not a big movie star like, you know, Gregory Peck or some of those type people, Elizabeth Taylor, whatever. But it, to me, you know, it was like, holy cow, I'm seeing Walt Disney, you know, in person. Walt was the type of person that would come out early in the park, early in the morning from the apartment above the firehouse, or later on from the Disneyland Hotel where he had a, uh, uh, a room uh, w once it was built in late 55, and uh, walked the park long before it opened. And you know, he's, you could just see the wheels turning, you know, his ideas, but he also wanted to know your ideas. You know, he would sit and talk to you and say, well now, what do you think, Bob, or what do you think, uh, Richard, or whatever, and um, you would give him your opinion, and then he would also say, well, you know what we're going to do over here, we're going we're gonna to do this, we're going to try that, what do you think about that, you know, and, and he wanted to know your ideas, and that was quite common for all the employees uh, to be sitting having coffee, and Walt come over and just sit down 
and talk to you. When I was a foreman of the uh, Jungle Cruise and uh, Walt came up and asked me uh, a question about the operation of the Jungle Cruise and uh, uh, basically the, the dock was set up, you know, to unload zone, a standby and a loading zone. And it was all the same width. We had a real problem with congestion of the Tiki Hut and benches behind it. So Walt came up and he said, well, now what do you use this standby area where you bring the boat up waiting to load? And I said, well, basically we just use it to walk from the unload to the loading or to bring guests, you know, through there. And uh, he said, well, then if we took out those props, we could move the dock out, couldn't we? And give us more room here. So I'm sitting there and I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I wonder why I never thought about that. You know, I mean, I'm over here and operating this ride and I know as, as well as anybody and Walt comes up and, and suggests this. So, you know, in a way it was almost embarrassing that to think, you know, that, hey, but that's Walt. That was his genius of how he looked at things. When I met Walt, it was early one morning. Uh, my job was to go around through nature's wonderland and get the cobwebs off of the animals. And I was working on a marmot and I had an old GI brush and I had to raise the marmots up. They worked with air back in those days. And I was using the GI brush and I was combing the marmot. Walt come through and he says, son, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm getting the cobwebs. He says, they come out of the ground. They're supposed to look all raggedy and stuff. So he climbed up on the rock and we messed the marmot all up. We got the cobwebs off, but he showed me how to do it. And uh, I was quite happy about that because it was kind of a hands-on thing. And he says, you'll know how to do that from now on. If I were to describe Walt Disney with one word, it's impossible. But he was the greatest caster of talent that ever came along. Well, I would describe Walt in one word, as far as I'm concerned, one of my best friends. And that's a lot, because a lot of people are scared of him. <laughs> While Walt Disney was known for a lot of different, you know, attributes and so forth, I would have to say what I most admire about having all the success that he did, that he maintained, and I put it into one word, was humble. Describe Walt Disney. Inspiration would probably be the word that comes to mind. Um, as a kid, I was so inspired by, by Disneyland and, of course, all the Disney films that were coming out in that early 70s time period. And I just remember being truly inspired. And, I, and even when I was probably in second grade, I couldn't wait for my opportunity to join the Disneyland cast. Boy, that's a tough one, um, you know, because Walt clearly was a genius. But when I think about Walt Disney, the thing I think about most is how compelling of a storyteller he was. You know, if you think about it first with animation and then with live action films, and then translating that into the special place we call Disneyland, it was about hearing the story for the first time and being compelled to come back and see how the story changed over time. I think that was his genius, but I'll use the word storyteller. Walt Disney was a tremendously creative person. Uh, that gave inspiration to the people he worked for and to the people around the world. The word that comes to mind when I think about Walt Disney is family and I think it has to do with the fact that he built this place for his daughters and it was so that he could spend time with them in a you know, wonderful environment such as this. So I mean family is what comes to mind. Walt Disney was a magician. Everything he did, his films and his parks, had an element of magic in there that no one else in Hollywood um, ever, ever was able to do on the scale that he did it. And I think Walt Disney appealed to uh, the better angels of our nature. My real joy was the rides and getting into the rides. I would sneak into the pirate ride when it was under construction. Uh, I got caught in the Haunted Mansion uh, exploring in there when it was about to open. And uh, so the big job for me when I was at Carnation was to get into operations. So I did. And that was where I met Dick Nunes for the first time, who encouraged me with my artwork. 
and I had finished an attraction for a ride based on Mary Poppins. And it got to Dick's office, and he said, well, the next time I go up to WED at that time, uh, which was Walt Disney Imagineering's original name, it, meant it was based on Walt's initials. Uh, so I, he said he would take it up to WED, and he did. And I, it landed me an opportunity to come up here and talk with uh, some of the, the people in charge at that time. And they looked at my portfolio and they said, it's okay, but it isn't great. You know, so I was like, ah. They suggested I go to school, art school. So I spent two more years polishing my skills at Long Beach State, came back up here with an art degree, and I also had a crazy machine that um, they loved, and they had me bring it in from the car, and I brought it in here just about to where we are now, and everybody, all the designers and everything, came here to watch the marbles rolling through this crazy machine, but I never heard anything. And uh, weeks passed, and the last day of the Christmas holiday that year in 1969, 70, I took my clothes back, as I did every night after the shift, and they said, oh, we've got a thing here to pull your, your uh, you've been reassigned up to Imagineering. And that was how I, I found out that I'd been hired from the wardrobe department at Disneyland. And when I arrived here on Monday after that weekend, I went in the lobby and they said, oh, you're here early. We didn't expect you for another week, but you might as well go to work. And uh, that was how it started. And Walt wanted to do the first, first booklet about Disneyland to use to sell to sponsors. And I did one on Liberty Street, which many years later became the Hall of Presidents at Walt Disney World, and one on Edison Square, which uh, became the Carousel of Progress. And I wrote the first hardcover book about Disneyland. But the key thing was, and this is getting to um, what opportunities there have always been in the company, still today. And that was one morning I went with uh, Eddie Mack, who ran the publicity, was a, a, a real pixie, amazing person, who could walk into the publisher, the Los Angeles Times, Norman Chandler, just walk into his office without uh, an appointment or anything. Uh, we were having coffee one morning in Hills Brothers uh, on Main Street, and Walt came in, sat down with us, and he turned to me and he says, what are you doing these days? And, and I said, well, I'm working for Eddie in publicity. And Walt looked at Eddie and he said, uh, well, we're going to have to give Marty something more important to do. And the next thing I know, came time for the New York World's Fair, and uh, I ended up up here working with John Hench on uh, the Ford Pavilion and working on It's a Small World and working on the Carousel of Progress. And, and uh, it wasn't just because of that chance coffee in Hills Brothers, but when I talk about Walt Disney as uh, casting people, I mean, you just look at the people that he brought over here to Imagineering. You know, all these opportunities because someone wasn't worried about what you did yesterday. He's only worried about what you were going to do next. That's what I, I've always loved about uh, the company and about the, the way Walt Disney created this business. The cast members in importance to Disneyland uh, is the same today as it is, was back in the in the early days. Uh, you know, when we went through training back in, in uh, 1955, uh, they gave us key phrases of friendliness, uh, courtesy, this sort of thing to, to use with the guests. And I think that's what made Disneyland uh, a step above everybody else in the business in those days. And to this day, uh, an important factor of of how cast members relate to the guest. Well, the cast members are what gives Disneyland its uniqueness. Anybody with imagination, who is funny, can build things. But that's how, that's how people take home when they visit Disneyland. They go home with a memory. It's in their mind, it's in their hearts. Half of the magic at Disneyland is making people feel good when there are like literally thousands and thousands of people being uh, taken through each experience and through each restaurant in an hour. And that is where the real magic lies. Van France was really, I like to refer to him as the Jiminy Cricket 
of the company. He was hired in the very early days, 1954, to come up with the first training program for the cast members. And he did a fabulous job. It was, you can create happiness. Van was uh, a one of a kind. I mean, absolutely incredible. Uh, coming out of, I believe, out of aerospace uh, and uh, understanding what Walt wanted to accomplish and, and some of the things that, that he wrote in uh, training uh, are just incredible. First of all, they set the pattern for everything that followed. The uh, uh, cast members being a, a good host, being on stage, all of that uh, came out of Van. I remember writing Van when I was departing Disney, you know, telling him that I understand that there is such a thing as the Disneyland Alumni Club. And, is there any role that I could perhaps play? And I'll never forget, I was in my office at USC and the phone rang and I hear this, this gravelly voice say, hello, Matt. And I said, this is Matt. And, and he said, this is Van France. And I immediately stood up. I don't know why I stood up, probably just out of respect. He wasn't even in the room, but I stood up and I was thrilled to be talking to Van. It was Van France that said, hey, you know, you, you, you can take the person out of Disneyland, but you can't take the Disneyland out of the person. And he said, we need to start a, uh, an alumni club and have people come back and get together and reminisce and just have, you know, a, a great time and continue that tradition of Disney. Well, Van France was my trainer uh, in 1955. Uh, Van was the man who got up there and gave us the introduction to Disneyland and what it was all about and all of the things that it was expected of uh, Disney cast members. And uh, he became a institution, I guess, at Disneyland with uh, creating the University of Disneyland was training programs to uh, instill the, the old philosophies and keep them rolling and going on and on and on. Uh, over the years and uh, he was a individual who was a colorful personality and a unique person that uh, as far as I'm concerned was one of a kind and made one heck of a contribution to making Disneyland successful from the cast member relationship, cast member guest relationship. Well I thought it was fabulous 50 years first of all it seems like just yesterday that we all started but it was really a great event. I think Ron Stark and, uh, and the Alumni Association should be very proud of what they did. It was a fun event. It was great seeing people, uh, you know, uh, someone like Cicely Rigdon, who I hadn't seen for 20 years, who used to run uh, the tour guides at Disneyland and also here at Walt Disney World in the very beginning. So it was just a great event. I was surprised to see so many people I didn't recognize. <laughs> I, you go, boy, a lot of people have worked at Disneyland. And I saw a lot of familiar faces, but I was just astonished by how many people I didn't know. I thought I would be running into everybody, you know, and I was a pretty visual person at the park. You know, I was street performing everywhere and I was on the horseshoe stage and, you know, and, and a lot of those people didn't even know who I was. And so it was, it was, uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, fun to kind of meet some new people. There were some old entertainers there that worked the park before I did and meeting them was, uh, and hearing their stories, was a real kick. You know, the past cast members who came from around the world to celebrate this wonderful camaraderie that we all have, they were so enthusiastic and they were such big fans. I think all of us who are part of the Disney family are fans of Disney and we're also very proud and honored to be a part of the magic. I wasn't surprised at the numbers that came uh, to the reunion. The relationship of cast member to cast member has been uh, unbelievable. I was so impressed by the turnout that we had. I mean, the show itself was incredible, the planning that had gone into it, what the Alumni Club, what the director, the board of directors had done, then to go and see it, and then see all these cast members that had done every kind of role that you could imagine, to see them there, and the one connection was that they loved their experience working at Disneyland, and it just, it was just a, a wonderful, heartwarming feeling to have. Watching Wally was pretty phenomenal, um, and, and remembering <laughs> how many laughs uh, I had at the same joke over and over and over and over and over again at the Golden Horseshoe and watching Wally and seeing him do that again is pretty incredible. 
I love the Mouseketeers because it's just my heart connection. I was a, I was a little Mouseketeer that sat there with my T-shirt and my name on the front and my mouse ears on every weekday watching Tommy and Sherry and Annette and all those kids and I grew up right along with them. So that was definitely my favorite part. Um, when I was first given this assignment, I felt uh, uh, very excited and honored at the same time because I knew we were going to be able to uh, meet uh, these old folks that work with uh, Walt and uh, we I'm sure we would you know, hear good experiences from them from the old times uh, that made me really excited. I was amazed uh, when uh, uh, Linkletter ca came out at 11 o'clock at night uh, which everybody was surprised to see him there and without one note he reminisced about Walt Disney and the opening of Disneyland and those of us who were there we remembered those days, and it was really a nostalgic moment for all of us. Dana Daniels stood out. Uh, Luigi, I believe, is the parrot's name. I mean, laugh until I thought I was going to die. Um, I think Marty Scalar at one point thought I was choking. So, uh, but overall, that event really stood out. Art was standing backstage. It's a long evening for him. But to see the stamina that this guy has at his age, and just as soon as he walked on stage from backstage, he was on. And it was amazing. It was amazing just to see how, how just over the years, just, you know, he's able to keep it going. The setup that night was about par for what we normally do. We try to go full out, but we knew that with a, a Disney event coming in, we wanted to give it a couple extra touches. Um, some Mickey gobos in the moving lights and a uh, couple extra effects that we don't always give to everybody. As the follow spot operator, you have to be focused on the one person that you're following. And it's a very important event because people that go back in Disney history were gonna be here. And it's always interesting to hear the stories about how things began. One person I've always liked uh, to hear is Art Linkletter. Wally always does a good show. When he hit the stage, he did a show that was unbelievable. When Marty shared, it brought us back to the early, earliest of days. It brought us back to the history, to the evolution of it just sprouting, and to some of the people that were a part of it, to some of the people that helped make it a place that would still be around 50 years later, that people would still care about and still love. Actually, what stuck out on my head was the Wally Bogak, because I actually never saw it at Disneyland itself, even though it ran for the longest time. And it, it was great. It was, I should have seen it when I was there at Disneyland, when I went to visit the park many times. My biggest thrill was at, at the very end, they had everybody on stage singing this song. And, you know, I'm out, the curtain's about to open, and I look at Wally, and I said, did you, do you know the lyrics of this song? I know they gave them to me, but I really didn't look <laughs> And he goes, I don't know what they are. So he says, I got an idea. Let's make balloon animals. <laughs> so, so we both were up there kind of mouthing along this song and making balloon animals at the same time and shooting balloons out in the audience. And to me, that was, that was a big thrill, just to be on stage with Wally making balloon animals. And, and uh, it was just a great, great time. I think the highlights for me, other than the entertainment, were, were talking to people and getting to hear people's stories, share their stories, share my stories with them about working at the park. Just being together with all of the people who had all helped create the magic over the years uh, was really an exciting time for me. I started at Disneyland in the summer of 1977. I actually had two jobs while I was there. The first one, I was a sweeper in Tomorrowland. Now, being that this is, it's a summer that Space Mountain opened, it was incredibly crowded, and, but I loved it. Because as a sweeper, you know, you're, you're out there and you're the first Inevitably, when someone has a, a guest has a question or a, a comment or something, you're the first one they, they talk to because they turn around, oh, there's a sweeper. Well, let me ask them, hey, how do you get to whatever? Or what? and, and it was really fun. So I, was, I talked to the, the, uh, the, the people a lot, the guests a lot. And also, you were not stuck in exactly one spot the whole time. You actually had, had this whole area you could walk in. I got transferred after that, that summer to the Jungle Cruise. Uh, in Adventureland, and I was a ride, ride operator on that, and I loved that. Now, no one, no one really believes this, but it's the truth. I actually was quite shy before I became a Jungle Cruise ride operator, 
And I really do credit the Jungle Cruise with helping, helping with my comic timing. What I loved about the Jungle Cruise is one, the jokes were so incredibly bad. And, and two, you had this captive audience. You know, for, I don't know how, many, how long is a Jungle Cruise, you know, 10 minutes or something like, it, one after another. And you could try out the bad jokes and see whether you got a laugh, whether you got a groan. I always loved getting the groans. And the bigger the groan, the better you knew you were doing with it. And so I really enjoyed that. I remember when, when I was first being trained and I had the standard operating procedure spiel. And I was memorizing that and I was so nervous. I was so incredibly nervous. And I kept reading the script and trying and I could never remember it all, right? And so then I got there for the day I was being trained in the boat. And we had this empty boat, me and this other uh, trainee was there and we went around and I was seeing the things I was supposed to kind of remember and I was flubbing it up badly and we each were promised we got to do two empty boat runs for rehearsal right we each went around once and it was my turn next for my turn out and they were loading the boat and I just went like oh no because I knew I did have it memorized and it was like that. And I looked down at the guy who was training me and he just had this little grin like, let's see how you do it. And I swear, I don't know what, I don't know what happened to me, but it, something in me clicked and everything I, I could remember, you know? And, and it just, I had fun and I was like relaxed and I was, I was joking with people and I was just like, it, I remembered it all. And I came around and, and when the, the the lead came up, poked his head, how are they doing? And my trainer just goes, he's done. You know, get, and so they just started loading the boat from that point on. And I couldn't wait to get back in the boat. I mean, it was one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. I worked from 1962 to 1980 in most all of the shops in the park, starting with the uh, shops in Adventureland and tomorrow, Frontierland. Uh, they were leases at the time, and when they were taken over by the park, then I went to work for, for Disneyland as per se. I loved all of them. Of course, I like people, so I enjoyed every minute of it. Well, as a Mouseketeer, it was so much fun because we got to perform at all of the wonderful locations, the fun locations around the park. We performed at the Mickey Mouse Club Theater, and we performed at the Carnation Plaza and Holiday Land, and sometimes we'd even do shows over at the Disneyland Hotel. And that's where we got to stay when we worked down here. Well, I'll tell you, it was a great time back in the 60s and 70s. We had the space stage over here. We had the Coke Terrace. Before that, we actually had the K-Bell and the Spacemen who played back here at the Space Bar. And I actually started playing back there in the 60s. But playing out here was always great because the crowds were great, warm summer nights, uh, coming up out of the ground there. Every place I've ever played in my life, there's nothing been better than coming up out of the ground in the Coke Terrace. The best part of performing at Disneyland, like Rick said, was the enthusiasm of the crowds that came to see us perform. They always enjoyed the topical music that we played during the, uh, during the performances. In the mid-60s when we started playing here, this was the happening place. If you wanted to meet somebody, this, this was it. Sonny Anderson, who booked the bands at the time, had his pulse on the community. And so we're coming out here, we're playing time, the music of the day for, but with a family orientation. It, it, was, it was just aw awesome. We'd get here and it'd be a beautiful summer night. Fireworks would go off. And that was our cue at the end of the fireworks spectacular. Boom, the lights would go on and we'd be over here at the space bar. We hit that first note and it was magic, oh, yeah. just absolute magic. The kids would just crowd the dance floor, crowd the stage, it was incredible. Well, the wonderful thing about Disneyland is that every land or area has its own unique themed music. Here in Tomorrowland, when we performed together, we were the Nocturnes. But if we were to play over at Carnation Plaza, we'd be doing dance music, big band, on the Rivers of America shows. It might be in New Orleans jazz might be the entertainment click tracks for a parade or performing in the parade. As an entertainer here at Disneyland, you had to be versatile and we had to please many different tastes in music and entertainment. What was special about working at Disneyland? Hmm. Who wouldn't want to work at Disneyland? It's a great place. It's, we used to come in the morning and we would warm up the Utopia cars. Now what kid could get to do that? We'd be traveling at 35 miles an hour in the morning. 
we get to we got to play in a circus first year we were down there. We were entertaining in the circus. I had this little Peter Pan outfit on. I'd swing Sharon around and, uh, with a rope and with a little ladder. We'd be going back and forth. It was being a kid. It wasn't like work. It was fun. Well, I worked at Disneyland actually starting in 1970. And they put me right into the foods department. And then after that, I kept watching around, where else would I want to work there? And I decided the tour guide department would be excellent. I used to watch those tour guides take those tours, and I thought, that's great fun. So I became a tour guide, and I actually became an Italian tour guide, and was escorting um, the uh, ambassador right from Disney, from uh, Italy. So I had some great fun doing that. When I worked at Disneyland, I worked in guest relations as a tour guide. I met, where I met some very uh, interesting people, such as uh, football players, movie stars. Uh, also, one of the most uh, interesting people I met was em Emperor and Empress of Japan, who visited Disneyland back in 1970s. One day at a holiday gate, Walt came in and he had his uh, Lincoln and it had no pass on it. And I was working as security at the time. And he came up to the holiday gate and he said, officer, he said, do you think that uh, it would be okay for me to go through this gate? And I, I said, Mr. Disney, you could go through any gate you'd care to. He said, okay, but the name is Walt. I said, okay, thanks a lot, Mr. Disney. And he said, no, the name is Walt. He said, there's only two misters here, Mr. Toad and Mr. Lincoln. And that was the way it always was with him. He really, you know, first name basis. He said, this is my family park. And he said, that's what I've always wanted. And he said, I hope that everybody will understand that. Started in the character department in uh, 1979. Uh, I was uh, still in high school and uh, went out to an audition. I really didn't want to work there at Disneyland because uh, I didn't want to cut my hair, and, uh, but I went to the audition, I thought it'd be fun. I went with a bunch of other people from high school and I ended up actually uh, offered a job. And then I thought it over and I thought, well, this might be actually fun. So I went ahead and cut the hair and got the job and it was the uh, best decision I ever made. It just started a, you know, long part of, uh, you know, launched my career. You know, it's really impossible to describe Disneyland in one word, but I think for me, I would put it in a few words. I would say, it's where I'd love to be. And whether, you know, that's again something that I think everyone has different reasons why they'd love to be there, but that's why it's the most attended spot on the planet, is that it fulfills that sense of wanting to be there. It is a place for uh, families. It is a place where the world goes away and it's a place where uh, happiness rules. Disneyland. Well, of course, for years it's just been pure unique. Escape. Playground. Emotional. It's a place that you go, that you can be a kid again, you can enjoy yourself, you're safe, you feel comfortable, and it's wonderful. The people are great, and it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Disneyland is eternal. It is, um, it's part of our, our heritage, who we are as, as Americans, I think. Walt knew he just captured every person's imagination and put it there in a big theme park. It's, and it's Walt Disney's heart and mind. It's like walking into Walt's brain. It's awesome. Well, the great news is the first 50 years has been nothing short of truly magical. But if you think about the innovations over that time, and most recently, things like our new fireworks show. Remember, dreams come true. We spent 50 years learning that fireworks shows happen in front of you, and then in a blink of an eye to our guests, but for us, like 10 years to get ready for it, they happen around you now. You know, Buzz Lightyear's Astro Blasters, for the first time we put you on a ride and not only took you through the story, but made you part of the story. That type of innovation will take us into the future. We're gonna bring back the submarines that everyone loves so much. We're gonna have them with a whole new ride story and a character that didn't exist 10 years ago. You know, those are the type of things, great innovation, whether it be rides that now interact with you, whether it be rides that take you to places that didn't exist before. 
that's always been the, the story of Disneyland. It'll be the story of Disneyland going into the future. I look at where we are at Imagineering today and at the Walt Disney Company as kind of embarking on a new journey. Uh, the turn of events uh, are very exciting to me. I've met John Lasseter. He was a Disneyland Park uh, employee when I was building Big Thunder. And just like I snuck through the fence and went into Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion, John snuck through the fence to come and visit me building uh, Big Thunder Mountain. And while I don't remember it, John is very fond of a real nice Imagineer who came and discussed with him, you know, like things about how do you, how do you get a job like this in Imagineer. And he thought it was a very cool, you know, that I had a job that to him was very cool at that time. So we have a bond. And uh, so as he takes on uh, a great role now in the Walt Disney Company, I'm really looking forward to that. And the Pixar people love Disneyland. There are people there that while they haven't worked there, they take every moment they can to get down to that park and enjoy it with their families. And so uh, it's in good hands. And uh, I hope to be a big player in what this will allow us to do because it's, um, it's a new era and, era and it's going to be very exciting. As we go into the future in the next 50 years, I think that, that not only will it always be changing as Walt, the way Walt wanted it to, the Disneyland itself will respect its history and protect and preserve you know, these, these rides, these places, these things that Walt himself touched, that Walt himself built and designed, and the streets that Walt himself walked on. That is something that, to me, is so special and unique about Disneyland. Disneyland will be there forever. It will be entertaining families for forever. Long past its 100th anniversary, long past its 200th anniversary. I absolutely believe this. And, and I think that we, we, we alumni who worked there helped give Disneyland its life help give Disneyland its spirit, help give Disneyland the magic that people felt. That's what's special about Disneyland. It's not just the place, but it's its people as well. And that won't ever change. Well, for a new cast member coming to work at Disneyland, I think the important thing is to believe in your company, believe in the job that you're doing believe in the, the philosophies of the company and always put your best foot forward to maintain the reputation of that company uh, is the most critical thing that uh, a new cast member can do. The advice I would give a new cast member is to really feel a part of what this whole institution is. It's not just whatever your position is that you're doing. You're impacting vacations for people that have stayed for so long that come here. You're part of an experience. You're part of a feeling that they're going to carry with them forever. And just to really feel proud about whatever your role is in the show. Enjoy the moment. Whatever you will have, enjoy and embrace the moment it will create a wonderful memory for a lifetime. If I was to talk to a new employee about working at Disneyland today, I would tell them that we need to continue to recreate the magic, provide quality and guest service to all those that visit our park. There are great traditions and uh, ways in which we treat people at Disneyland that need to continue. But equally important and one of Walt's strongest features is he was always relevant to what popular myth and culture was all about. In fact, in the 50s when Disneyland started, Walt Disney owned popular culture on television and the theater and so forth. So Disneyland's role in the future is carrying forward the traditions that Walt Disney established, but making sure that every generation that comes to the park finds things that are relevant for their time as well. And I think that's what we've really got to do and make sure is still there that, you know, whether you're 8 or 80, you can go to Disneyland and find something that is a smile and about what makes you tick. If I were talking with a new hire to the Disney company today, I think the, the, what I would want to impress upon them is the power of one person's vision. That, that what Walt dreamed of all those years ago is still alive today. That Walt Disney can still bring tears to people's eyes. When you, when you mention the name. The power that he has that we're even in this room today is because of Walt Disney. 
And we all have that potential to have that kind of a vision in our lives. As Disney cast members, we have a responsibility to honor that memory, that vision, to continue what Walt started and not to let it disintegrate or deteriorate or become whatever anything else out there in the entertainment world is. Disney is unique. It stands head and shoulders above everything else out there because of Walt. I certainly can only say thank you to thousands and thousands of people who've worked there through the years uh, making the place what it is because Without the people, Disneyland's just a bunch of buildings and, and uh, kind of silly stuff. But the people are what make it happen, and the people are the ones that deserve all of the, the praise and thanks and, and, uh, from not just me, but from every shareholder in the company as well. Thanks for making the magic, because it's like the license plate that, that we have here at Imagineering. It says, we make the magic, and I think uh, it's really a co combination of uh, all of the Imagineers and all of the Disneyland and around the world, the Disney cast members who have made that magic. For those of you that have worked for Disneyland over the past 50 years, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's because of the people. The people who designed it, the people who work there today, who work there in the past, who've, who've kind of set the standard so high. And I think that's what makes Disneyland so magical for families, is its people as well as the, the place. And so thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Walt Disney. I'd like to thank Roy Disney. I'd like to ha thank Van France for hiring me. But most of all, I'd like to thank all of you who were part of the beginning, a part of what's going on now. And the most important thing in one way or another, we'll all be part of the future. And the Walt Disney Parks and Resorts are known and respected around the world. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. 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 I think for all of you who were there at the beginning or even in the first 10, 12, or 20 years, I can say that you have a, you have a memory that is rare in the possession of human beings. Because my definition of success in life is doing what you love to do with people you love to be with. And that was the core of Disney. Disneyland is a place where the cast, where you folks made the feeling of a homey, warm companion, uh, joining in the fun and laughter of a family group there to have some special day. And when you put all those memories together, uh, it spells success, your life was a success during those times, and I'm sure has influenced the rest of your life after you left Disneyland, and it urges you to come back when the clarion call, when the horns blow and the gathering of the group comes together, you want to be there. That's the answer. That's it, right? That's it? No, 
We've just covered 50 years of magical memories here at the happiest place on Earth. We need to start the next 50 years. In which case, I want to go on some rides. So, well, I tell you what, I have some tickets they here. They don't use those anymore. What do you mean they don't use no, them no, anymore? No, 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 no. I want popcorn Pop now. No, no, no. Let's go ride Space Mountain. No, I don't want to go on Space Mountain. I want to get popcorn. And then, then a Coke. Okay, a Coke is good.